Hello, this is Jim Herring here. This video is a talk, but a virtual talk, and it's one that I might have given maybe in a shorter version at the Dunbarn District History Society, AGM. So today we're talking about the 1899 map of Dunbar, and this talk is about the first quadrant. The, I've put together the presentation, but I've been given a lot of help, particularly from Liz Curtis and David Anderson, as well as Alison Grant, and we owe some debt to the Scottish Place Name Society, Kenny Mall, and to David Serby, that we'll see later. So we're going to look at the map in some detail. Here is the map in front of you, and you can see that at the top of the map, it looks at the Victoria Harbour and looks at the rocks off the harbour and off the west, the west promenade, which we know today is Winterfield Promenade. And so we're going to look at that first, and then we're going to come down the map, uh, more or less in the middle of the map, and look at some of the, the new buildings. Now, when I say new buildings, I mean that there's a couple of buildings here. Hotel Bellevue and the Roxburgh Hotel that were not on the 1893 map. And going further up towards the old harbour, the old ship in isn't on that map either. So these three buildings were built in this period. And lastly, we'll be looking at the, the bottom third of the map and looking in particular at the retreat. So if we first of all look at the rocks of Dunbar, and we can see that they're all named here, and of course all these rocks are still there, uh, and can be seen when you walk along the promenade, or if you're up the harbour, go to the battery and look out to sea. The rocks are still there, and just as they were in 1899. So let's have a look at some of the, the names on the map here. First of all, look at the Delves, which is, if you look at where it's in West Promenade and just up to the right from that, the Delves is an area of rocks. And the origin of this is probably from the Scots to dig. And it's an area of rock that, when the tides out, may look as if it's been um, dug over. And that may well be the origin of it. Now, if we go out to sea and look at some of the rocks, on the left, there's Wallace's head. That's a fairly straightforward one because it's named after William Wallace, the, the Scottish leader, um, hero to some and uh, less of a hero um, to other people, depending on your viewpoint. Under Wallace's head is Oliver's ship. And this is after Oliver Cromwell, uh, who I'm sure would not be described as a, a hero uh, in Dunbar having beaten the Scots at the Battle of Dunbar in 1650. And the last one on this part of the map is called Half Ebb Rock. And again, it's fairly self-explanatory. That's to say that this rock is covered at half tide. So when the tide's half in or half out, the rock can't be seen at all. Okay, the next what we're looking at is the Delves and Wallace's head and half a brook. And this is a photograph um, of that. And Liz Curtis provided this photograph. And you can see that the Delves are in front. Uh, and again, you maybe have to use your imagination, but it may be that the locals are called at the Delves because it may look as if some parts have been dug out. And there's Wallace's head there and half a brook. And you can see that there's a spike on top of half a brook. And this is visible when the tide is coming in or coming out, but the rock isn't. Okay, let's move on to more of the rocks here. The Scarp Rock is one of the, the best known rocks that we can see from um, the shore. And when we look at it, because it's called Scarp Rock, and this is from the Scots for Cormorant or shag, 
and on many occasions when you look out here then you can see that the the rock is you know, occupied by cormorants and shags and um, this is from a, a website and the, it's the image is used under the common license so let's look at more of the rocks off dunbar if we go along um to along towards from the half air rock we can see that we've got castle foot rock and this is named again fairly obviously because it's not far from the foot of the castle and then you have round steeple and long steeple and basically these are named because the fishermen obviously thought they looked like towers and the scots the tower is a steeple just like you get a church steeple but it's a, it is a scottish word uh, meaning tower and then you have the yets just um, to the right of round steeple and long steeple and these are from the scots word yet which means a gate and so they must look like um, as if they were gates outside the harbour going back along past the harbour and past the castle rock just above you'll see there's an, a little land there called boys bus and bus is a scottish name for a rock and this probably means bays rock and in, in other maps it, it's called bays rock and the the word bus as i said is a rock but it means a rock that's exposed at low tide so it is covered up but then it's exposed and it would be Bay's Rock because it's quite near St. Bay and there was a well, St. Bay's Well was there and that's where we get the modern day uh, Bay's Well Park, Bay's Well Hotel. We go on to Tarry Ship and Dub Rock now. Tarry Ship is an, an area, just if you see the photograph here from, um, from David Anderson, that's marked in red that's an area called the tarry ship now there's it's not definitive definition but the likelihood is, is that when at low tide the, the, the rocks are, are fairly black here uh, and thus the name from tarry ship may have come from there now one rock that is, is well known to all of us is called the dew rock and obviously the that we know it as the dew rock and it was part of the just um, next to the, the old swimming pool that was there and sometimes you see the the dew rock described as the black rock and the reason for that is that the Gaelic word for black is dew d-h-u however as you can see on this map it's called the dove rock and it's just under the Dunbar castle at the bottom of the map there in the middle and it's called dove rock because it had doves in it or pigeons on it and one likely explanation is that there was a, a fairly posh visitor coming to Dunbar and asked a local perhaps what was the name of that rock and he told them it was the Dew Rock because that's how it's known locally and this man or woman may have gone away and thought that Dew would probably mean black may, could have been on a day where there's no sunshine we don't know but it's certainly dove rock and it's and because there's dues on it and this morning i received a photograph from liz curtis with the dew rock and with dues on it uh, and the dues have a long tradition in dunbar the wild dues as well as the racing pigeons and there i remember in the 1960s there was a, a very active pigeon racing a club in Dunbar uh, and there was quite a number of people involved in sending pigeons over to France for example and them coming back and every year this pigeon society had a dance and it was called locally the Do Do. Another very familiar rock to us would be the pincushion and this is my own photograph of the pincushion which is just off the promenade and Essentially, you can use your imagination, it looks a bit like a pink cushion and it's got an interesting origin. David Anderson has told me that the, 
This pin cushion actually comes from the Scots preen cod or preen cut, which is a name for the old Scots name for a pin cushion. And in some of the earlier maps, it appears as pin cod instead of pin cushion, but it's the same um, origin. And this is an area where boys over the many years have been climbing up to the top and some of them have got stranded at the top and had to wait um, till the tide has gone out again because if you walk along Winterfield Prom you can see that the tide comes in and that there's a gully that forms at the bottom of the pin cushion uh, which, which basically cuts people off. Another two things on the the map, if we could just go to just above where it says Victoria Harbour, we can see Johnson's Hole and the Gripes. And this is a photograph, another photograph by Liz Curtis, which shows um, Johnson's Hole. What you can see in the photograph is the castle rocks on the left and then the scart rock behind it. And you can see the, the, the white on the scart rock where, where the cormorants and the shags have been. And then Johnson's Hole with, um, to the right there is the, the grapes and the castle rock, castle fruit rock is behind it. Now, we go back to Johnson's Hole. I looked up the 1853-4 Ordnance Survey name books, and this is how it's described. It says it's a situation a little north of the castle rocks and a cove line between the castle and the grapes rock. Now, the origin of Johnson's Hole is not, again, not definitive, but it's likely to be called after a local fisherman um, who may have kept his lobster pots there. And uh, Johnson is a well-known uh, Dunbar name. There was a Coast Guard officer in 1853-54 called Johnson, um, but it's unlikely that this area was called after. Uh, and the gripes is um, again comes from a Scottish word um, to gripe, which in this context means that a boat may get may gripe or get into difficulties. And that area, and it's obviously it could be uh, depending on the tide, quite a treacherous area to go around. Also on the map is Broadhaven, and you can see it's between the new Victoria Harbour, as it was then, and the old harbour. And it's a term that's quite familiar to us today, Broadhaven. Uh, Liz Curtis has kindly given me um, some information about the possible origin of this area. And it certainly it was called Lammer Haven in 1555, or Lammer Heaven. And one of the, the possible derivations, a likely derivation of this, is from the Old Norse, meaning a loading rock, somewhere where, where fishermen loaded their catch or uh, unloaded this onto, the, onto their boats um, to go elsewhere. And it, so it may be from the Old Norse, which looks to me like Hallohammer, but probably not the right pronunciation. And this rock is where MacArthur store is now, and I think that's probably where this photograph from the Harbour Trust um, is taken. And uh, so we have this um, derivation, and uh, I think it's pretty likely to be that one. Okay, so if we move into the town itself, away from the rocks and come ashore, we can see that uh, we just go to the left hand side of the, the map at the top there you have knocking here uh, and then you have the old bowling green which is opposite where the tennis courts are uh, now and then going along Stanley Place is uh, mentioned there's four houses in Stanley Place and next to that is um, Rosebery Place which um, was built from 1897 but, but doesn't appear on this map so if we then go along and come down the high street, we pass the new in barracks and Freemasons Lodge, which are on the 1893 map. Uh, and if we keep going down Beaumont, we'll see 
that there's the Hotel Bellevue and there's the Roxburgh Hotel, which weren't there in 1893. And going back up the map, as I mentioned before, the old ship in to the right uh, of, of the High Street wasn't there in 18, the 1893 map either. So, if we first of all look at the Hotel Bellevue, I looked up the, a website about called Secret Scotland about the Hotel Bellevue, and uh, I found a description saying that the, the hotel was built in relation to the seasons and the weeks and the days, and I thought, I don't think that this can be true. Uh, I think um, somebody may have got it wrong. However, I then found an, uh, another website called Listed Buildings, in Scotland, and it looks a very authoritative site. So, as it says here, the the style um, echoes an, an architect and, uh, with the fantastic name of Henbest Capper, uh, and he obviously built a similar he or she perhaps built a similar building in Ramsey Gardens in Edinburgh in 1892. Now, the the Bellevue Hotel, as we know it, we did know it rather before it got knocked down was built in 1897 and as it says the, they found the date on the original wallpaper and that was very common in those days too and right up to the, um, the 1950s, 60s um, painters and decorators who were decorating people's houses would write the date of the when they put the wallpaper up behind the wallpaper and would often put their name on as well. So the original interior, I say the symbolism and plot for this, it says you've got seasons for four floors, you've got 12 public rooms, 12 months, you've got seven bathrooms, days in the week, 52 bedrooms, weeks in the year, and 365 windows, all in relation to the calendar. And the hotel was built for a Mrs. Fleck, and it became a very popular hotel. Now, one of the things that we can see from here is that this hotel had 52 bedrooms, but it only had seven bathrooms. And this wasn't particularly unusual um, in those days. And of course, we have to remember that in all the bedrooms, there would be at least one or more chamber pots. So you wouldn't, uh, in modern days, you might think, well, there's only 52 bedrooms and seven bathrooms. There's going to be a long queue in the middle of the night. but. I think that was probably would be an unusual occurrence. Uh, this photograph is from uh, taken just before the demolition of the hotel, and it's from fourth demolition, but their site has has uh, been deactivated now. But as you can see, it's a very impressive building, um, and it's where the Bellevue flats are now. But in its day, it was one of the most impressive hotels, certainly in East Lothian and, and, and probably in Scotland. If we move down the road to the Roxburgh Hotel, and we, again, we can see that a very impressive building, the Roxburgh Hotel was built um, in the 1890s, between 1893 and 1899. And you can see again, this was a very impressive building and uh, it was a very prestigious hotel. And of course, when it was built, it was called the Roxburgh Marine Hotel. It later became the Roxburgh Hotel. And one of the things you can see, this is from an exhibition that Pauline Smead did for History Society last year. And two of the keys here are from the hotel. And my friend Nigel Marcel, whose parents owned the hotel in the 1960s, said that this was a quite a common occurrence for people to go away with the key, but on the back of each key, it said a fixed stamp and people would put a stamp on uh, the, the key and post it back to the hotel. Uh, so the system worked. Okay, we'll go to the final part of the quadrant. We can see that uh, it's dominated by Lockheed Woods. Uh, and you can see that, that just a, it says police borough boundary. And below that, there's a municipal boundary. So the, there was a difference between the the, the boundary for where the uh, for the police um, and and the town itself. 
Now, we'll come back to the retreat in a second, but if you look down to the right hand side, you can see that the slaughterhouse is there um, and East Lodge, um, and they were there in the 1893 map. So, if you look now at the retreat, this photograph is sent by David Serby, who gave a really interesting talk to the History Society uh, last year about the, this building, about the retreat, which is still standing, it's still a very impressive building. And David sent me some notes, and then the, the, the technical uh, description of the retreat is a yellow orange stone um, with a symmetrical facade with coarse squared iron stone rubble. Uh, the door is in the middle and five symmetrically placed sash windows that we can see very clearly um, in the building there. So the, the retreat was built round about 18, between 1820 and 1822 and, and David identified that. And that the people who built the retreat were a man called Thomas Hayes Coles and he was supported by his mother Alison Coles. So it has a very interesting history in terms of being one of the perhaps impressive houses in, in Dunbar um, ever since it was built. So we've had a look at this first quadrant of the map and then um, I'll be putting on other coordinates of the map in, in due course. And so we've looked at the, the rocks at the top of the, the map here at the harbour uh, round. And so I hope you've found it um, interesting about the rocks themselves, um, about the hotels and about the houses. So thank you for listening, as I would say if I was giving a talk. So this has been a virtual talk. Uh, one of the things that you might try and do, if you can link your laptop up to your television, and if you listen to the, the talk and look at it on the bigger television, it may give you some sort of idea that if you are at the, a meeting, at the History Society meeting, um, then you will be part of an audience. Now, we can't do that at the moment. We can't be part of an audience, but who knows when we will be. This time next year, we'll be looking back and we will be having our AGM, fingers crossed, in uh, 2021. As I would say, thank you for listening.